Section 6 of My Life in Christ by St. John of Kronstadt Translated by E. E. Gulioff this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. If men, weak, short-lived, mortal creatures, do so many great and wonderful acts by means of the powers and capabilities they are blessed with, if sometimes many millions of people obey the single word of one man, then what cannot the great author of all human life do? What will not obey his word? Remember the words of the centurion. I also, said he, am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Furthermore, if many animals are also gifted with skill to do various wonderful things which cannot even be done by a man, the animals which we trample underfoot, which are insignificant and weak, then what is there that cannot be done by the Creator of everything and everybody, who has bountifully endued all with all skill, all capabilities and powers? If the soulless grass, which to-day is and to-morrow is cast into the oven, is formed by his word into such delicate and beautiful shapes, if every substance we see is obedient to his word and changes into incommensurably endless variety at his sign, by means of the five elements only, who then, seeing all this, will require greater pledges of his omnipotence? Wonderful are thy works, O Lord, at each step and at every moment of life. Heaven and earth are full of the glory of thy wisdom, of the glory of thy mercy, and the glory of thy omnipotence. Thou art not only thyself the most wise creator, and constantly manifest thyself as such, but thou also givest the capacity of creating to thy creatures, so that they create at thy word, through the powers which thou hast given them, wonderful and useful things. O, oh, in what splendor thou hast arrayed thyself! How we have abased ourselves in our nature of sin! But how dear and great we are in the sight of God! For our sakes he did not spare his own Son, but clothed him with our flesh, gave him our nature for our salvation. He has prepared for us from the creation of the world, an everlasting kingdom, and our conversion rejoices good angels. And yet what do we do? We do not even wish to know this, and debase ourselves lower and lower. We slay our souls by various vices and earthly passions. It is sad, inexpressibly sad, to look upon man, a creature created according to God's image, and sad especially to look upon the Christian, found worthy of such a high calling, so much esteemed and so loaded with benefits by God. Forced prayer develops hypocrisy, renders a man incapable of any occupation requiring meditation, and makes him slothful in everything, even in fulfilling his duties. This should persuade all who pray in this manner to correct their mode of praying. We must pray gladly, with energy, from the whole heart. Do not pray to God only when you are obliged to, either in sorrow or in need, for God loveth a cheerful giver. In all the temples of the bodies of pious Christians, which are not made with human hands, there is a mental light, the soul, and that light is derived from God, the wise Son, who is visible in the world in the same way as the soul is in the body. I notice how God, the mental Son, enters and shines in my soul, for then I feel happy, warm, and bright, but when he goes away he leaves the soul in darkness and suffering. As in material nature the darkness is caused by the departure or setting of the sun, so likewise in the spiritual nature 
the darkness is caused by the departure of the mental sun from the soul and by its being covered with the darkness of the accursed one as in material nature there is always some remainder of light after sunset by reason of the incomparable size of the sun so also in the soul there is some remainder of light even after the departure of the mental sun by reason of his omnipresence and by reason of the comparative weakness of the prince of darkness who without god's permission is unable to completely darken the soul but we must beware also as the lord has said lest darkness come upon us completely when you are granted recovery from any illness render thanks to god in the following short form of praise glory to thee lord jesus christ the only begotten son of the everlasting father who alone art able to heal all manner of sickness and disease in men that thou hast had mercy upon me a sinner and hast delivered me from my sickness not allowing it to develop and slay me according to my sins grant to me from this time forth master strength to firmly fulfil thy will to the salvation of my accursed soul and to thy glory and that of thy everlasting father and of thy consubstantial spirit both now and for ever and to ages of ages amen what is a pure heart it is meek humble guileless simple trusting true unsuspicious gentle good not covetous not envious not adulterous my soul remember thy heavenly dignity and do not be disturbed by corruptible worthless things honour also in other people their heavenly dignity and do not dare offend or hate them for any perishable cause love with all thy might that which is spiritual and heavenly and despise that which is material earthly remember the words of thy saviour give us this day our daily bread only this days the highest christian wisdom lies concealed in these words remember also that the lord himself showed during his life an example of being untroubled in regard to means of subsistence and was contented with voluntary offerings only my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work you hate your enemy you are foolish why because if your enemy persecutes you you also inwardly persecute yourself for say is it not persecution and the most cruel persecution to torture yourself by your hatred towards your enemy love your enemy and you will be wise oh if only you knew what a triumph what blessedness it is to love your enemy and to do good to him so did the son of god so did god in the holy trinity triumph and still triumphs through his love over the ungrateful and evil-natured human race so also did god's saints triumph over their enemies by loving them and doing good to them while we were yet sinners christ died for us if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life do not be despondent when fighting against the incorporeal enemy but even in the midst of your afflictions and oppression praise the lord who has found you worthy to suffer for him by struggling against the subtlety of the serpent and to be wounded for him at every hour for had you not lived piously and endeavoured to become united to god the enemy would not have attacked and tormented you glory to thee saviour almighty power glory to thee saviour omnipresent power glory to thee 
fount of mercies, glory to thee, ever open hearing, ever ready to hear my prayers, accursed as I am, in order to have mercy upon me, and to save me from my sins. Glory to thee, to thy brightest eyes, looking lovingly upon me, and penetrating into all my secrets. Glory to thee, glory to thee, glory to thee, sweetest Jesus, my Saviour. Hearty faith is indispensable for man, because the light of our intellect is very limited, and cannot contain much mental light, while the Lord our God is infinite light, and the world is an abyss of his omnipotence and wisdom, whilst in us there is only, so to say, a drop of his power and wisdom, because only so much, and not more, can be contained of them in our perishable flesh. The earth is hard and inert, though it revolves very fast round the sun. Water is liquid and rapid, therefore people say a current is rapid. Air is still more liquid, more rarefied and more rapid, and therefore it moves very quickly, as, for instance, in the case of winds. Light is still more ethereal, more rapid, and in one second it travels over incredibly great distances. If light is so ethereal, and traverses immense spaces in the shortest possible time, then what must the created spirit be, and how ethereal and rapid must it be? Finally, what must the uncreated spirit be, the Lord himself, how immeasurable must he be, if light in one second moves with such awful rapidity, then how rapidly must the uncreated light, the source of all light, and of everything created, move in intelligent created spirits? Finally, how must the light which created everything embrace all his creatures, all the multitudes of worlds? Glory to thee, the light immaterial and uncreated, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Most men not only bear Satan's burden willingly in their hearts, but they become so accustomed to it that they often do not feel it, and even imperceptibly increase it. Sometimes, however, the evil enemy increases his burden tenfold, and then they become terribly despondent and faint-hearted. They murmur and blaspheme God's name. The usual means that men of our time take to drive away their anguish are entertainments, cards, dancing, and theatres. But such means afterwards increase still more the anguish and weariness of their hearts. If, happily, they turn to God, then the burden is removed from their heart, and they clearly see that previously the heaviest burden was lying on their heart, though frequently they did not feel it. Oh, how many men there are who have forsaken God, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no living water. Men have very many such broken cisterns. Nearly everybody has his own. The broken cisterns are our hearts, our passions. When you see faults and passions in your neighbor, pray for him. Pray for everybody, even for your enemy. If you see that your brother is proud and stubborn, and behaves proudly either to you or others, pray for him, that God may enlighten his mind and warm his heart with the fire of his grace, and say, Lord, teach meekness and humility to thy servant, who has fallen into Satan's pride, and dry from his heart the darkness and burden of the evil one's pride. If you see a wrathful brother, pray thus, Lord, make this servant of thine good through thy grace. If a mercenary and greedy one, pray thus, Lord, thou who art our incorruptible treasury and inexhaustible riches, grant that this servant of thine, created according to thy image, may recognize the deceitfulness of riches, and that, like all earthly things, they are vain, fleeting, delusive. 
for the days of men are like grass or like the spider's web and thou alone art our riches peace and joy if you see an envious man pray thus lord enlighten the mind and the heart of this thy servant that he may recognize the great innumerable and unsearchable gifts which he has received through thy boundless generosity for in the blindness of his passion he has forgotten thee and thy rich gifts and although enriched with thy benefits yet he reckons himself poor and looks enviously upon the blessings which thou o our unspeakable benefactor hast bestowed upon each one of thy servants even against their own will but in accordance with thy purpose take away most gracious master the devil's veil from the eyes of the heart of thy servant grant him contrition of heart tears of repentance and gratitude so that the enemy who has ensnared him alive in his toils may not rejoice over him and may not wrest him from thy hands if you see a drunken man say in your heart lord look mercifully upon thy servant allured by the flattery of the belly and by carnal merriment make him understand the sweetness of temperance and fasting and of the fruit of the spirit arising therefrom when you see a man passionately fond of eating and finding all his happiness in this say lord thou art our sweetest food that never perishes but leads us unto life eternal purify thy servant from the filthiness of gluttony so carnal and so far from thy spirit and grant that he may know the sweetness of thy life-giving spiritual food which is thy flesh and blood and thy holy living and acting word in this or in a similar manner pray for all who sin and do not dare to despise any one for his sin nor be vindictive is through this you would only aggravate the wounds of those who sin but rather correct them by means of such advice threats and punishments as may tend to stop or restrain the evil within the limits of moderation from the action in our heart of two antagonistic forces one of which firmly resists the other and forcibly and cunningly invades our heart always slaying it whilst the other is chastely offended at every impurity and quietly withdraws itself from the slightest impurity and when it works in us appeases rejoices vivifies and delights our heart that is from the two individual antagonistic forces it is easy to be convinced that both undoubtedly exist the devil is the constant destroyer of men and christ is the constant life-giver and saviour one is darkness and death the other light and life therefore you who love god if you sometimes notice in your mind and heart extreme darkness affliction and grief contraction and unbelief as a force strongly opposing faith in god then know that the power inimical to christ the devil is within you this is the dark and destroying power which having stolen into your heart through any sin often prevents your calling upon christ and the saints hiding them from you behind the mist of unbelief wherefore in order to torment us because faith saves us from his snares but it is just this which proves the existence of the opposing sovereign power of god the christ which the devil keeps us from by the abomination of unbelief and which can alone vanquish by means of our faith the evil force and keep it in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day therefore it is necessary to make every effort to call upon christ the saviour with perfect faith it is indispensable for every christian to acquire the habit of turning quickly to god in prayer about everything in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto god 
in everything give thanks, joining your thanksgivings to praises, after the example of the angels, exclaiming, Alleluia! The greatest gift of God, which we mostly need, and which we very often obtain from God through our prayers, is peace or rest of heart. As the Lord himself says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Therefore, having obtained this rest, rejoice, and consider yourself as rich and possessing all things. Let everybody remember constantly that he is God's, soul and body, and that he depends on God for all his spiritual and bodily wants every moment of his life, and therefore let him turn to God every time that he feels a want of anything, either for the soul or for the body. When, for instance, he is oppressed in body or soul, that is, when he is stricken by sorrows, spiritual sickness, or by passions, bodily sickness. Also, when he is threatened by the inconstancy of the elements, of fire, water, air, storm. Likewise, when he is about to undertake anything. Let him then remember the author of all things, who created everything from nothing, and who has bestowed various powers upon his creatures, so that they may accomplish many and various works. Every good thought presupposes the existence within us of a good and higher origin, instructing our soul in holiness. This is evident, because it seems as if everything good were somehow hidden in us, and that we endeavor in vain to introduce into our heart that which was its former inheritance. How true are the words of the Apostle! What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Every good thought, all natural gifts. Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? We notice in ourselves the struggle between faith and unbelief, between the good power and the evil one, and in the world between the spirit of the church and the spirit of the world. There, through the spirit, you will distinguish two clearly antagonistic sides, the side of light and the side of darkness, of good and evil, the spirit of the church and of religion, and the spirit of worldliness and unbelief. Do you know why it is so? It is owing to the struggle of two antagonistic forces, of the power of God and the power of the devil. The Lord works in the sons who are obedient to him, and the devil in the sons of disobedience. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And I, too, often feel within me the struggle of the same two antagonistic forces. When I stand up to pray, the evil force sometimes painfully oppresses and weighs down my heart, so that it cannot raise itself to God. The surer and stronger are the means that unite us to God, prayer and repentance. The more destructive are the actions brought to bear against them by God's opponent and ours, who makes use of every means to attain this end, our body, so inclined to laziness, the weakness of our soul, its attachment to earthly goods and cares, doubt, so near to every one, incredulity, unbelief, impure, evil, and blasphemous thoughts, the oppression of the heart, the darkening of the mind, all these are brought to bear against the inattentive through the action of the enemy, in order to put a stumbling block in the way of their prayer on the ladder that leads us up to God. This is the reason why so few pray sincerely and heartily. This is the reason why Christians so very seldom prepare themselves for Holy Communion, so seldom confess and receive the sacrament. Our strength, our soul, is invisible. The soul of animals is also invisible. In plants also, their strength, their life, is invisible. 
the whole material world exists and is moved by an invisible power, by the laws of nature. In the higher regions there are the heavenly powers, pure and free from everything material. Everything heavenly and earthly, the highest and the lowest, lead up to a single almighty power, which has produced every power in heaven and on earth. Thus let every power praise the only one power in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And let all earth-born creatures praise it, especially through the all-binding power of love, everywhere diffusing life and blessedness. For a long time I did not clearly understand how necessary it is that our soul should be strengthened by the Holy Ghost. But now the Most Gracious Lord has granted to me to know how indispensable this is. Yes, it is necessary every moment of our life, just as breathing is. It is necessary during prayer and throughout the whole of our life. Unless He strengthens our soul, it is constantly inclined to every sin, and therefore to spiritual death. It becomes enfeebled, loses all power, through the evil that enters into the heart, and incapable of any good. Without the strengthening of the Holy Ghost, one feels how the heart is undermined by various evils, and is ready to sink every moment into their abyss. Then it is that our heart must stand firm as upon a rock, and this rock is the Holy Ghost. He strengthens our powers, and when a man prays, he strengthens his heart by faith and by the hope of receiving that which he prays for. He inflames the soul with love to God. He fills the soul with bright, good thoughts, strengthening the mind and heart. If the man has any work to accomplish, he strengthens his heart by the conviction of the importance and the necessity of his labor, and by an invincible patience which overcomes all difficulties. He inspires in the man, in his intercourse with people of various positions and both sexes, a respect for the human person, who is made after God's image, whoever it may be, and is redeemed by the blood of Christ the Lord, and makes him disregard the sometimes very unsightly outer appearance of another man's body and dress, as well as his roughness of speech and manners. It is the Holy Ghost who unites us all through love, as the children of the same Heavenly Father, and in Jesus Christ teaches us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. Imagine that you see the inaccessible light from which the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars proceeded, that you see the infinite love which sent into the world its only begotten Son, to save the world from eternal torment, that you see the primeval beauty from which are derived all the variety and beauty existing in the world, the variety and beauty of plants, stones, shells, fishes, birds, beasts, and all human beauty. Imagine that you see the Creator of heaven and earth, loving, resplendent with the inaccessible light of His perfections. What will you then feel? And the Christian faith prepares us all for this vision. Observe the plants. In them are evident, 1. The wonderful wisdom appearing in every part of the plant. 2. The life-giving power, strengthening and maintaining every part of the plant in its proper condition. And 3. The omnipotence, by which the eternal wisdom changes the aspect of formless matter so easily, making it answer his everlasting intentions and purposes. But thou, Lord, art most high for evermore. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. In the same manner, as objects situated at a great distance off on the earth, though they may be large, are quite invisible from afar if the sun is not reflected in them. Whilst even small ones are visible a long way off if the sun is reflected in them. So it is also amongst men. 
those in whom the eternal sun of righteousness god is not reflected in his perfections are only noticeable when quite near by a very few but if the sun of righteousness is reflected in them then they are seen by all from a very great distance they are glorified by all they are people of all places and of all times the saints some of them shine like the sun others like the moon and others like the stars gazing upon god's creatures and seeing their infinite variety i see myself exalted above all their multitudes by the likeness and image of god by the understanding and by freedom by the capability of being able to examine all of them by means of my intellect and to wonder at the wisdom and graciousness of the creator is manifested in them oh how i ought to reverence my creator oh how i ought to honor the authors of my being my father and my mother they have given me existence for a time for a time and for eternity they have led me in accordance with the will of god who created me in my mother's womb into the magnificent palace of the world so that in due time the creator may admit me into the palace of heaven the state or any society is a body and as in the body god has put all the members together and each one separately in their proper places so likewise is the social body god has set each one in his proper place the deeds of each one being the reason of his occupying this or that particular place every one sees that light is shed upon the earth from heaven because the sun the moon and the stars light us from the heavenly circle this shows that the uncreated wise light the lord our god dwells preeminently in the heavens and from him every light descends upon us both material and spiritual the light of the intellect and of the heart that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world god is love all thoughts feelings every disposition of the heart tending to destroy love and create enmity proceed from the devil let this be engraven in your heart and hold fast in every way to love follow after charity bear in mind that which is in opposition to the old carnal sinful man that do go all your life against his will this is the object of your life and also your glory in jesus christ they that are christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts establish in your heart the following truth one thing alone is worthy of all our hatred that is sin or vice and towards men nourish exclusively love the royal law is plain thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself when during prayer your heart is overwhelmed with despondency and melancholy be sure that these proceed from the devil endeavoring by every means to hinder you in your prayer be firm take courage and by the remembrance of god drive away the deadly feeling observe if not in your thoughts then in your heart the enemy often endeavors to blaspheme the name of almighty god what constitutes blasphemy of the heart against god doubt unbelief despondency impatience under god's chastisements murmuring and all the passions by unbelief in god's truth and mercy the enemy utters blasphemy against the truth mercy and omnipotence of god by despondency he blasphemes god's goodness in general by the outburst of human passions he blasphemes god's all-merciful providence and truth establish in your mind and heart this truth that the invisible plays the first part in the whole world in every being and that when the invisible leaves a certain being the latter loses life and is destroyed so that the visible in beings without the invisible 
forms but a mass of earth. I and all men live through an invisible first cause, God. Men are enveloped in the darkness of ignorance of God, of themselves, and of the enemies of their salvation, who can therefore easily rob the mental house of our soul, its mental wealth. When it is said to the inner man, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, the real sleep of the soul, very like the ordinary bodily sleep, is meant. Also, when it is said, My heart, awake, why sleepest thou? The real sleep of the heart is meant, and it is not said merely allegorically. When the body sleeps, it is weakened in every part and becomes insensible. So likewise the soul, sleeping the sleep of sin, becomes weakened in its power and insensible to everything that concerns faith, hope, and love. Tell it, for instance, that the Son of God came down upon earth for it, and became man to save it from everlasting death. Speak to it of his saving teaching, his miracles, his sufferings and death upon the cross, his resurrection, ascension, and his second coming. The soul cannot understand or contain all this. It is unable to feel God's benefits, but is asleep, perfectly asleep, to faith, hope, and love. It does not fear the righteous judge, future torments, the worm that never rests, the unquenchable fire. It sleeps, it neither hears, nor sees, nor feels. It is remarkable that bodily sleep begins with the heart. First of all the heart falls asleep, and afterwards the body. The sleeper's eyes are closed and do not see, neither do his ears hear and it is the same with the soul that sleeps the sleep of sin. But the soul ought always to see through the eyes of the heart, even during sleep, as it is written, I sleep, but my soul waketh. You cannot have failed to notice that all our strength lies in the heart. When the heart is light, the whole man feels at ease and happy, whilst when the heart is heavy, he feels wretched. But this relief you can only find in faith, and therefore especially in the church, as the place where faith predominates. Here God touches your hearts through His cleansing grace, and gives you His easy yoke to bear. This is a great mystery, which is worth everyone's knowing. When the heart is light, the man is ready to run and leap. This is why David danced when he played before the ark. End of Part 6